welcome students in our today's online lecture and our today's topic is a poem the face that lones the thousand ships by christopher marlow and this poem is prescribed in b a part first paper first of poetry and drama in english literature and let's have a brief intro of the poet and poem so the poet is here christopher marlow he was the contemporary of william shakespeare and christopher marlow was the son of john marlow who was a shoemaker if he talk about his early education he was educated at the king's school canterbury and cambridge he obtained his degree from cambridge in 1583 Marlowe was a genius of unquestioned individuality and independence of thought and feelings. Marlowe held and propagated atheistic opinions and a warrant was issued for his arrest in 1593. And eventually he was killed by someone. And if we talk about his greatest contribution in literature in dramas his plays embody the true renaissance spirit of the age and some of his famous plays are tamburlaine dr foster's and the jew of malta these are his famous works now moving ahead to the background of this poem the present poem is an extract from christopher marlowe's play dr foster's so it has been taken from his greatest play dr foster's and it has taken from scene first of act 5th of this play dr foster's who is the main protagonist of this play he was a magician and a doctor of medicine and divinity who sold his soul to satan in lieu of material things like wealth power women and wine He takes Satan's assistant Mephistopheles as his servant, who brings him whatever he wants. So these lines actually have been spoken by Doctor Foster himself toward the end of the play when he demands that Helen of Troy, who is the princess of Troy, should become his beloved. When Helen appears, he is stunned by her beauty. he asked if this is the same face that brought about the great war of troy so whose face he is talking about the face of helen and he sings in praise for helen whose beauty shines like a thousand stars she is brighter than jupiter and she is more lovely than the reflection of the sky he once again asserts that the only she shall be his beloved his paramour means his beloved this address this is a kind of address to helen where the speaker speaks about his personal emotional uh, love feelings it actually also speaks marlowe's poetic potential it also highlights the renaissance spirit in his plays so now coming to the text of this poem here we are let's begin was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burned the topless towers of helium sweet helen make me immortal with a kiss her lips suck forth my soul see where it flies come helen come give me my soul again here will i dwell for heaven is in these lip and all is rose that is not helen so actually this is the famous apostrophe of foster to helen here the beauty of the parison of helen has mesmerized dr foster he immediately surrenders himself his heart and his soul to her and become her 
become her, her ardent devotee. So, he said, what he says? Was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of William? So, the face is of Helen and launched means a thousand ships. So, it is actually a reference to the war of Troy in which Greeks came flocking in thousand ships and besieged Troy for 10 years to recover Helen. And topless towers means the majestic buildings the, not topped by any other. Ilium. Ilium is the city of Troy. So, wandering her beauty, wandering at her beauty, Faustus marvels whether it was indeed this face that led to the famous war of Troy involving thousands of ships from each side leading to the burnt the topless towers of helium means leading to the burning away of the sky touching towers of helium sweet helen make me immortal with a kiss he claps her to his bosom and entreats her to her to let him have the immortal thrill of a kiss on her lips come helen come give me my soul again here will i dwell for heaven is in these lips Make me immortal means give me the eternal joy and suck forth means drought and all is draws that is not Helen. Draws means worthless. He gives away his soul. He wants to give away his soul to her to Helen through his kiss and she becomes the sole mistress of his life's breath. She has the power to enslave him for even to set free his soul at her will. So Faustus continues to dote on Helen's beauty. She is his deity, his worship, his sole object of love and adoration. In her lips he finds the bliss of heaven, for heaven in these lips. He finds the bliss of heaven in her lips and aspires to dwell in them forever. So everything that is beautiful, all is rose that is not Helena. It means all beautiful or lovable things in the world is a part of Helena. And everything which is not part of her which is everything besides her is valueless it is dross means it is worthless now moving ahead i will be paris and for love of thee instead of troy shall winterberg be sacked and i will combat with weak menelius and wear thy colors on my plumped crest. Yeah, I will wound Achilles in the heel and then return to Helen for a kiss. So, Paris is a reference uh, to the prince of Troy who eloped with Helen. And Menelius was Helen's husband actually. And Wintenberg, first place of birth where he was born, plumbed. What does it mean? Plumbed crest means head get decorated with birds, feathers, crest, like helmet, his crown. Achilles was a brave Greek general whose only weak point was his heel. So here the reference is actually I will wound actually sing the hymn. And so in these lines, Foster says about his will that he says, like Paris, who was the prince um, to whom Helen eloped, so he says that like Paris, he will become Helen's lover, even if 
this love for her leads to the city of Wintenberg being burnt to ashes. So he doesn't care if his city is being burnt and he will fight against to whom? To Helen's weak husband Melanius. He is considered weak because he could not protect his wife against the advances of Paris. And after winning a victory over him, he will wear her ensign as a token of victory on the crest of his helmet, like medieval knights. So, Faustus goes on to say that he will aim an arrow at the heel of Achilles. He will wound Achilles at the heel and inflict a mortal wound too on him. And after this achievement, what reward he is expecting? That after this achievement, he would come back to Helen to get a kiss as a reward. Foster says that for the sake of Helen, he will equal Paris exploit in killing Achilles and then will return back to Helen for her love. And at last, Foster says that he would come back for her adoration, for his great victory and to live with his beloved forever by forgetting everything about hell or heaven. So, this is his strong will. Now, moving ahead, O thou art fairer than the evening air, clad in the beauty of a thousand stars, brighter art thou than flaming Jupiter, when he appeared to hapless seemingly, more lovely than the monarch of the sky, in wanton Arethusa's or jeweled arms, and none but thou shalt be my paramour. So, paramour means his beloved. Clad. Clad means clad in the beauty of a thousand stars. Clad means covered with something. And uh, Jupiter. Jupiter in Greek mythology, he is considered the god of uh, the sun god. Okay? The god of sky. The sun god. And Simeli. Simeli was a princess who loved God Jupiter and prayed the God to visit her. But uh, she was burnt when the God appeared in all his dazzling brightness, accompanied with lightning and thunder. Monarch means a king or a queen. Wanton, wanton means playful. And Arthusas or Jord, Arthusa name of a spring okay ajor arms means blue surface of the lake arthusa and paramour means beloved so here uh Foster's actually and uh, he gets strained by the incredible beauty of uh, Helena and uh, uh, he compares Helen's dazzling beauty with the beautiful sights of nature here and to the go Greek gods and goddesses who were well known for their beauty and splendor. So, as we find here, In comparison of Helen, he finds that all these things are worthless. How? In comparison of Helen, they, they all seem to him matchless or faded. Her splendid beauty. Oh, thou art fairer than the evening air. So, he compares Helen's beauty more brighter, more fairer than the evening air. Her splendid beauty even surpasses the loveliness 
clad in the beauty of a thousand stars, it surpasses the loveliness of the evening sky, which is full of numberless thousand stars, shining stars. So, now brighter are thou than flaming Jupiter. He says that she looks so brighter in comparison with Jupiter, even in all his gla- glorious brilliance. When? When he appeared to a hapless Simele. He appeared on her behest before Simele. Simele, who was the princess of Thevis, who loved Jupiter, when Jupiter appeared before her in his full brightness and glory, in the result, Sibeli was consumed to ashes instantly. Okay? She was burnt. More lovely than the monarch of the sky, in wanton Arthija's ajoured arms, and none but thou shall be my parama. Now, the matchless beauty of Helen is more graceful than more lovely then the monarch of the sky, here the monarch of the sky who is the Jupiter, sun god himself. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, sun god Apollo, okay, himself, when he was enjoying in wanton Arthija's ojoad arms, when the sun god himself enjoy, enjoying, was enjoying the pleasure of love in the arms of the water nymph Arthija. So, here Marlowe has created so many uh, Greek in Greek god and goddesses, uh, imagery of Greek god and goddesses to highlight the intense feeling of Dr. Foster's towards Helen and all these lines and none but thou shall be my panama here. At the end, he declares that all these, uh, the beauty, beautiful objects of nature, all are worthless to him. And none but Helen will be his beloved, will be his paramour. So he says that the beautiful Helen will be his ultimate paramour. All these lines actually compare the beauty of Helen with other beautiful objects of nature. But Helen surpasses all. These famous lines shows how Faustus reached his final damnation. By embracing the spirit of Helen, he forgets the thoughts of heaven. So, these are highly romantic lines which bring to our mind several mythological stories simultaneously and the lines are highly suggestive and highly poetic as well that makes strong appeal to both our imagination and emotions so with this we have come to the end of this poem i hope you have understood the poem well now we will meet in our next lecture thank you students